This isn't something we get to see very often. Giraffes lying down. And this may be, for a lot of you, the first time you've ever seen them doing this. So a great start to this live safari here in Juma Private Game Reserve. You can see that individual that Brian has just zoomed into now is chewing on something. And, oh, morning. Time to get up. Oh, I wonder, have they seen something? The other two are looking in the opposite direction that Brian showed you. Maybe it's just that time of the morning to wake up. As I was saying, though, the one female was chewing the cud, and these are the same five giraffe, I'm guessing, that we saw yesterday on the Sunset Safari. So some of you may have been with us to enjoy them then. Let's creep forward and have a look at what may have spooked them. Could have just been a false alarm. My name is Scott. It's a great pleasure to have you on board with me. And I'm teamed up with Brian Joubert on camera. On the other vehicle, James Henry and David have headed out. And Kirsty is directing the show with Leanne, Nikki, and Louise all in there giving her a hand. No, I'm not going to shine the spotlights on them. We're just going to rely on some silhouettes. I'm going to try and work out what's what. There doesn't appear to be any immediate danger here. Cat, very happy that you can confirm that this was your first sighting of giraffe lying down and four out of the five of them and not only that but we also got to see how quickly they can get up if they need to and not only cats a lot more of you have also just shared a first time experience with us and that is the beauty of being on safari live there are so many different things we can experience out here even though it may be with the same species, there are, uh, there are so many variables in terms of sightings you may have with any given species. So, like I said, a great start. If any of you do not know how to get a hold of us like Kat just did, it's very simple. You can send us a tweet using the hashtag Safari Live, or you can email questions at wildearth.tv. As you can see, it's a cloudy day out to the west. That's the direction they are moving in. But also to the north, south, and east. It's eight-eighths cloud cover here in the Saabi Sands. Hopefully it will bring some rain to this drought-stricken landscape. But there's no guarantees that will happen. At least, though, it will be keeping us and the animals cool, so it's more likely that we will see them active and enjoying the cool weather. It also means for the vegetation that there will be less evapotranspiration, less moisture will be sucked out of the earth and the leaves by the baking sun. So that's also good prospects for the plants as well. Ah, Donna One, I was wondering and waiting for one of you to ask what exactly the lights are out to the north and kind of west are uh, there they are there they're not as easy to see as it was in the beginning of the drive and it was a bit darker i think that that is possibly coming from a major town an hour and a half away from us called hood but i could be wrong but that is is far outside of the reserve i've never been able to pinpoint for certain though where those big bright lights are coming from it could be villages outside the reserve or it could be as far as hood sprays which even though maybe an hour and a half's drive it's not that far as the crow flies a lot of that uh, journey will be covered along bumpy dirt roads and that's what takes it what takes us so long vm did the trip yesterday to take sam back to town to fly back to his home in cape town 
hello to TB on YouTube and you would like to know if any people in the world eat giraffe. Yes, they do. Uh, not very commonly though, and even in the the venison trade, the wild meat trade, which is which is legal in, in South Africa. Um, just depends on where you acquire the wild meat from. But yes, the venison or wild meat trade in South Africa is, is a big one. Uh, but you don't commonly get a giraffe on the menu. More common things are kind of kudu and pala, your, your regular antelope, so to speak. But you can definitely feed on giraffe. And one thing that I would like to say further on this topic TB is that um, most animals in Africa will be eaten. Just about everything that moves um, will be fed on by certain people within certain tribes. There will be varying degrees of demand for various meats, but like I say, just about every animal will be fed on. And that's the interesting thing. A lot of the uh, local people uh, use local medicines, traditional medicines, and the, the doctors that practice this medicine will often use wild animals as to form part of their potions and concoctions. Um, or various parts of animals. I know vultures are highly sought after for the medicine trade, which is a big reason why their numbers are in decline. So the answer is yes on many different levels. I've never eaten giraffe though, but I have eaten many other wild game. And in a country like South Africa, um, there's a lot of uh, parks where the vegetation remains natural. So it's as if it, as it, as it, as it was uh, hundreds of years ago, all besides the fact that there are no predators. And therefore the antelope's numbers will grow dramatically every year or drastically every year and they need to be brought down so as to not over feed or over stress their, their habitat. So culling essentially is needed to be done. And what that means is that there's a surplus of, of wild game meat that can be fed on by us. Um, So not every wilderness area in South Africa does have the dangerous carnivores, and I guess therefore humans step in to keep the ecosystem in check. Now a lot of you are discussing the new male leopard we got to see last night. Wasn't that exciting stuff? I haven't uh, yet been able to confirm exactly who he is. I know a lot of you uh, have got reason to believe that he is a male from uh, the north, in, uh, no, the, nor the northern property from us, our northern neighbors, Buffelshoek. And it's even believed that he may have been seen mating with Karula, as well as I think another female on Torchwood. Um, either way, it's exciting stuff. He's got a very distinctive notch on his kind of right ear. Not really a notch, it's just missing the top little section of his ear. And it'll be wonderful to get to see him more. Hopefully he does become more relaxed. And for those of you who did not know about that, there is a video up on the Safari Live Facebook page of the brief sighting we had of him yesterday. It was really, really exciting stuff. And again, well done to VM for spotting it. Cool. Well, we are actually going to be heading onto our northern boundary now and heading all the way east towards where that leopard was seen last night. So it is possible we may find him. In the meantime, though, we are going to send you across to Mr. Henry for an update on his plans for the morning. Greetings. Greetings. Morning greetings here from uh, Rusty. That is this vehicle, in case you were wondering what on earth Rusty is. Uh, my name is James Henry. On camera today, we've got David. Hello, David. Very Hello, nice David. buff this morning. Navy blue. Wonderful. And uh, you are, as Scott told you, on a live safari, and our little idea today was to come down the centre of the property and see if we couldn't find sign of the Ngahuma pride, who seemed to have disappeared from the earth, really. They came into the reserve about two days ago, and then there were tracks were covered up by rain. We don't know where they are. We have absolutely no idea. They could be around any corner here. So that's part of the joy of being out here, of course, is that we just don't know what's going to happen. 
especially after a little bit of rain. So that's the story this morning. Remember, we'd love to hear from you. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And if you want to talk to us about Africa in general, or travel to Africa, or travel to South Africa, we have had lots of good discussion about that, and especially we've helped, I think, to dispel some of the myths and... Um, well, some um, legends about Africa that perhaps aren't true and are stopping people coming to visit us here. So please, if you have any questions like that, feel free to send them through. Just, I want you to listen quite carefully. It's a cold morning. It's probably about, it's probably about 22 degrees Celsius or 71 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are some cicadas calling. That's a very summer sound, and I haven't heard them calling for the last little while, and I'm sure it's a function of the fact that we've had some rain, and somehow, somewhere, I don't know if they're new ones that have just come out of the ground, because that's where they live, of course. But it's interesting, and I think it's going to be quite hot during the course of the next week, and it'll be interesting to see how many insects come out. There have been lots of insects, most of them seemingly in my bed, actually, and I think the rain is going to create an enormous explosion of insects around the place, which will be interesting, and hopefully, too, some froggies. On we go, David. On we go. It's quite dark this morning. And I'm sure that's because the cloud is thick, thick. Hello, Dylan. Good morning to you. Well, good evening to you. You're in Iowa. And you want to know what time it is that guests go out in the morning normally at the lodges. Well, interestingly, the guests at Weatala, the camp just next to where we live, that's the Juma camp. I have not gone out yet. I have not heard their range calling in on the radio. So I guess the answer would be probably around 6 o'clock. Half past 5, is we're starting to get a little bit early um, because there's no light. So I think mostly at Londolosi and Sangeeta and Mala Mala and the other lodges around here, Arathusa, guests will be meeting on deck at half past 5 for tea and then they'll go out after that. So probably around quarter to 6, 6 o'clock they'll be going out. They try and vary it with the sun, though, and with the changing light of the dawn. It's not a great idea to go out when it's too dark in the morning. You tend to drive over tracks, and that's not a great idea. And it's just a little bit more difficult to see things when it's dark, obviously. So, Dylan, by the middle of the winter, you'll find that guests are going out probably an hour later than they are now, quarter to seven. And... And then, a tea t and then in the afternoon, the times change as well, of course. So in the middle of summer, you want to go out probably around, actually ideally around half past four to five o'clock. So you've got sort of three hours of daylight and then half an hour or so of darkness. And it's obviously very hot in the summertime. And then in winter, in the afternoons, well, you can actually go out if you're staying at a lodge. I think it's quite nice to spend the whole day out and skip the sort of evening safari because it's very cold and you tend to see very little and it's very late at night. So it's quite a nice idea if you're on safari to actually spend the whole day out and skip the evening. Otherwise, to go out around half past two, three o'clock in the afternoon and be back just after sundown before the cold sets in. Thank you, Dylan. I hope you come and visit us someday. We're now on the southern boundary. Scott is on the northern boundary. And we'll head east in the same direction that Scott is going. Hello, Debbie. Um, let's have a look here to answer your question. If you wouldn't mind just panning over the, over the grassland here, please, David. Debbie, you want to know if there's been a flash of green since the rain we've had. It's not as obvious as it might seem from that shot, but yes, it has flushed. And Dave, if we come, let me just sneak a little bit forward. If you look over here, Debbie, this is where you can start to see the grass. If you get it up close and personal with some of these browning grass plants, you can see little flushes of leaves. And those are the green leaves of the grass. And you can see already most of them have been grazed. A lot of them the animals have had a go at. As soon as they flushed, the grazers in desperation have attacked them with relish. 
There we go. So although the entire sort of landscape hasn't been blanketed in green, there is absolutely, if you go to the bottom of each individual grass plant, certainly there are leaves coming up of all of them. And that will be a great relief for the grazers. That won't last for very long if we don't get a bit more rain. Like I say, we have had over the last 48 hours about an inch in total. Maybe an inch and a little bit, an inch and a quarter. Luciferia, uh, you're a relatively new viewer and you are very kindly concerned as to what we knew, what we knew when the rains fall, if the rains fall, we should say. Do we pull over? Do we put a cover on? Uh, it really depends on how bad the rain is. We do have a canvas rain cover that we can put over the very sensitive electronic equipment at the back here. And then David sits sort of half on and underneath it. And it's very amusing to watch if you happen to be sitting where I am. And then we'll carry on driving for a while, but if it really gets to be a heavy downpour, we'll go, we'll run for cover. We'll go back to home and sit underneath the cover. And remember, though, the rain here doesn't last normally more than an hour or so, and so very seldom do we have to actually abandon a drive. So yesterday morning, for example, there was some very pleasant rain just at the beginning of drive, and the Scott and Sam went back in for about half an hour or so and then went back out. So that's generally how it happens in Luciferia. But the Land Rover, it's interesting, is designed in such a way, it's an amazing thing, this, this is one of the quirks. The Land Rover, of course, is the most quirky vehicle you can buy, uh, short of buying a, mm, say, a Model T Ford, or indeed the original vehicle ever designed. But the, if you look at the steering wheel here, if you're driving along in the rain, what you find is that the steering wheel forms a perfect funnel of water that will be deposited directly into the middle of your lap. And so as soon as it starts to rain, you get a wet undercarriage immediately. Just ahead, Brian, it's ahead of us. Okay, everyone, there is a, a honey badger. We just need to try and catch up to it, hold on tight. Stop, where to stop? I've got a plan. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Brian, just stay on the left. If you stay, if you keep the camera on the left, there will be good. Okay, hold tight, everyone. It was just moving too quick for us, but we're going to be able to loop ahead slightly here, and I'm sure we'll be able to get you some good views of it. Just hold on be coming straight towards us now. Please keep coming towards us. Please keep coming towards us, Honey Badger. You may have got a glimpse of it. It was just moving too quick, so I've taken a major gamble here. I'm hoping it is going to pay off. We've just looped ahead. It was heading directly towards where we are now. Well spotted, Brian. I oh, know. Come on. Please keep coming. Oh no, I think I may have made the wrong decision there, everyone. Apologies, but... was doing the right thing. Oh. You may have just seen a brief black and white glimpse of what is an animal that we see so seldomly here. It was the first time I've actually ever been able to get a flash of one on camera for you. Oh. I think I made the wrong move there, apologies. But that is the reality of a live safari. There's no going back <laughs> to replay things. This is the creature that got us all so excited. 
They are incredibly tough, resilient, and wonderful animals that can stand up to even lion and leopard, even though they are much, much smaller, almost a tenth of a lion's size, yet they can put up incredibly long fights and sometimes even survive attacks from lion. As the name suggests, the honey badger, they do really enjoy raiding beehives and can even tolerate many, many stings from bees. And I've also seen a documentary where one was bitten by a highly venomous snake called a puff adder. It managed to kill the snake and what it did was it just rolled up into a ball after it had killed the snake. It lay next to the dead snake, rolled up into a ball, had a sleep for about an hour and a half or two, woke up, shook its head and then fed on the snake as if nothing had ever happened. Okay, well, that's that. We are going to be... Oh, wonderful. The, the girls in FC have already got a slow motion clip prepared. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to get a slightly better view of it. Well done to Brian, who not only spotted it, but managed to keep the camera on it while I was trying to loop ahead. So enjoy the clip and we will see you afterwards. I hope you got a slightly better view of it there. Um, and again, thanks Kirsty and Nikki and everyone in the final control room for making that happen so quickly. Great idea. We are now going to try and get out of this little uh, off-road section that we've got ourselves into. So we're going to send you back to James, who's found you another animal with its name beginning in an H. What a real joy to see a honey badger. I'm really jealous. They are the most fantastic little animals. So I'm so glad you got to see that. And indeed, a, an action replay, slow motion. Fantastic stuff all the way out here in the bushveld to be able to send you something like that. Those are not honey badgers, of course. In fact, I was thought initially that they were vultures sitting above a carcass, but they are not. They are a group, a flock of 10 hardy dar ibis. And the reason I've stopped here is not because the hardy dar ibis is an unusual bird, but because there are so many of them. I've not seen a flock that size. And the bird is so unremarkable that um, Kirsten sort of suggested I press on and try and find a lion. Uh, but I think it's astonishing that there are so many of them in this tree. And they do, as David said, look pretty ominous against that black sky behind them, well, gray sky behind them. It's a really rather special picture. Now, the hardy dar ibis, of course, is not a meat-eater bird. Well, it is a bit if you happen to be a worm and you consider yourself meat, then it would be a meat-eating bird. But that beak that you can see, that long, fairly terrifying-looking beak, is not very terrifying unless you try and catch the bird. It is used to probe the ground. And what I was reading about the other day was that the Boo is actually very sensitive, although it looks like a hard sort of chisel without feeling, like a, a nail or a, a horn. It actually is very sensitive and some, has some very sensitive nerve endings in it, which means that that bird can stick its beak into the ground and feel if there is a worm there and then pull it out. Now, I think that's quite astonishing. You might be able to do that with your fingers, but that bird can do it with a keratinous Look at that. Look at them flying. Keratinous sheath on the over its beak. It can feel a worm moving under the ground. Let's just sneak a little bit forward and see if we can't see them probing in the, in the floor. They will love this soil, of course, now with a little bit of moisture in it. It means they won't be bashing their heads against a concrete-like ground, which, of course, is a good thing if you don't want concussion. There they are. Oh, let's just watch them feed. 
The other advantage of doing this, of course, is that we can hear if any lions might call. There comes flying in. Now, I know it's difficult on the screen sometimes to tell the size of an animal like this, but these birds are about, I mean, from beak to tail tip, probably about a foot long. See, sticking their beaks into the ground. Mm -hmm. and as, I've, as I've said before, they have the most kind of incongruous and um, attention arresting call. It's, uh, it's really very unpleasant in the early morning after a large Friday night out, which is what happens in Johannesburg. They proliferate in Johannesburg because they eat a lot of the king crickets, or otherwise known as Parktown prawns, which are these great, big, terrifying, red-looking crickets that seem to proliferate in th after thunderstorms in Johannesburg. And these very kind birds clean them up for us. I think that's a really pretty sighting. Kirsten is coming round to it, she says. She says it's starting to look like quite a nice sighting to her. That's good. Well done, Kirsten. And for those of you who don't know, Johannesburg, of course, economic hub of, uh, well, used to be Africa before Nigeria took over as the largest economy on the continent. And many people come to South Africa and they sort of fly straight through Johannesburg to Cape Town, which is, of course, a very beautiful place. But Johannesburg does have its own attractions. Cape Townians, of course, will tell you that Johannesburg is a terrible place. This is because they don't understand that the amount of work they do in Cape Town is um, equivalent to a very small village in any other parts of the world. And so we need Johannesburg to keep the country going. You're in Atlanta, Georgia, and you want to know about the insects that we get here and how large they are. Well, Bonita, some of them are the size of your head. You can't believe the size of some of the insects that come through here. Terrifying creatures. Look like great big aliens. Now, Bonita, I think you'll find that the suite of insects that we get here is very, very similar to the size of the insect you get at home there. There's nothing particularly terrifying. I suppose the largest or longest insects we'd get would be some very big stick insects, which of course are totally harmless. They look like sticks, and you could get them up to a foot long in this area, I suppose, but I, that's very unusual. And then the heaviest insect, I guess, would probably be a dung beetle. You know, some of the dung beetles are pretty big, but they're also completely harmless and actually really entertaining to watch. You can pick them up and turn them over and look at them and study them, and they're really fascinating. And so I don't think there's anything particularly terrifying there. Um, we don't get a great proliferation of huge wasps and some things like that. They are around, but not very big. So if you are a little bit worried about insects, please don't be worried. I mean, yes, they can be a little bit awkward when you're driving along, and there are just so many of them, but they're almost universally completely harmless. All right, I think we'll leave these hardy dars to themselves. Oh, no, hang on. Apparently the hardy dars got something in its mouth. Let me get out my powerful binoculars. David, what has it caught? While we try and find out what that hardy dars caught, I'm just going to hail Scott on the radio. He wishes to speak with me. Go ahead, Scott. Last night, apparently the Eco Hoopers were on Zimbabwe Arithmetic Cut Line. I'm not sure if you want to head across there sooner rather than later. Did you hear? Oh, he's got a snake. Look at that, he's got a snake. It's unbelievable. That looks like one of those blind snakes. Maybe a Schlegel's blind snake. But you can see the bird is he's very pleased with his catch. And I don't think the snake's dead yet. It will be soon. But what he's doing, the reason he doesn't just swallow it, well, A, he needs to kill it first. But secondly, of course, remember, a bird has no teeth. 
and that is a pretty bony little reptile that he's caught there and so he'll want to almost kind of bash it and crush it with the beak so that the bones are all broken up by the time it eventually goes down into his gullet. That is amazing. This is fantastic. I've never seen that. That, that wasn't probed off the ground. That was simply stolen. Although, if it's one of the burrowing snakes, it's quite possible it was pulled out of the ground. Isn't that wonderful? So while we watch that, you may have heard from Scott who said that the lions were yesterday on Simbambili. And so what I think we'll do is go to the edge of the road here, to the corner, turn around and go back towards Arathusa and get an update from them. Simbambili, just to give you an idea, if you are a new viewer, we are on Juma. To the west of us is a reserve called Arathusa where we can drive, and just north of Arathusa is Simbambili. So if those lions came south, into Arethusa, then we will probably be able to see them or certainly have an idea where they are. I just think it's so interesting that he won't swallow it straight away. Or also that he's somebody's trying to steal it from him. He obviously has to be very careful about what he swallows. And I don't think it's got anything to do with sort of any kind of envenomation that could occur. I, you know, I think it's probably a fairly harmless snake. It looks like a blind snake to me. You do get some burrowing asps that are venomous and they resemble the blind snakes and you don't want to be fiddling with them. But I don't think that's what that is. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Good. Well, hang on. Scott is actually closer than us to those lines, so I'm going to suggest that he goes there. Scott, do you copy Scott? Scott, of you on Triple M, please feel free, go go for it. Um, go and see what you can find. I'm not sure, I'm uh, heading back west from the water bottle to the cut line. Uh, I'm making, just making my way there. Copy, I'm Gary Main Junction Cheetah Cut Line, so I think you're definitely closer. Okay, copy. So I think Scott will probably head that I'll, way because I'll he's a bit closer. Isn't that amazing? I wish I could identify the snake exactly. There it goes. No, still not. Gone. <laughs> Look how big that... That's a big hardy doll. Patty in New York, you'd like me to do the Ibis call again. Mm, Patty, all right, I'll do it once. Brian's very good at the Ibis call. It goes... Okay, let's carry on. That was a magnificent hardy dar sighting, top hardy dar sighting I've ever had in my life. You might get them to call. Come on, call. Canton, Tampa, you've mentioned a crane species that you get at home there, and you want to know if we get crane species here in South Africa. We do. Our national bird is, in fact, a crane, the blue crane, endangered species. But we don't find cranes in this area, no. Blue cranes tend to be more on the high felt and wetter areas, and I think you'll find that most crane species prefer areas that are a bit wetter than this. They tend to be um, foragers in fields and open grasslands, where often there's a lot of inundated water, so I think that's why we don't get any cranes in this particular area. We are now on the far eastern boundary, southeastern boundary. There are a lot of waterbuck around the place. And we'll just look at these ones here. And as many of you will know, waterbuck have a delightful scent about them. It's like a sort of a um, spicy horse, if you like. I'm sure you all know what a horse smells like. 
And these ones are like spicy horses lurking behind that bush there. There's a cow. And one of the most interesting things I think about them is the fact that they look like they've got teddy bear-like hair, which they do, of course, but it's actually quite sparsely spaced. So although it's quite long and they look furry, which is, of course, a ridiculous thing to be out here when the temperature reaches 40 degrees Celsius on a regular basis. The hair is actually quite sparsely distributed on the skin, so it doesn't make them too hot. It looks like a fairly sleepy female waterbuck. It's still very much an autumnal color to the leaves. And I don't think the trees are going to be flushing again while the grasses will. I think the growth season for the trees is probably over, although we had a very nice question yesterday about whether or not some of the trees might fruit. Uh, the trees like the marulas, maybe, you know, they had a very poor season and whether they might re-fruit again. And the answer, I think, is probably no. I don't know that for sure, but I'd say no. Twitter and you want to know how good the animal sightings are in late May and June. Marie, that's, it's not a simple question to answer and that's because it depends on where you are obviously and it also depends on, you know, what happened, the distribution of animals happens to be at the time. So for example, you could be driving along Marie in May and June or on an area like this which is 1,500 hectares or 4,500 acres and you could see nothing. It would be very unlikely, but you could see nothing, just given the fact that some of the animals might be away. The lion prize might not be here. There might not be a leopard on the reserve at the time. But May and June, I think, is a brilliant time to be out here because the chances of you seeing things are very high. I think that the vegetation will be much thinner than it is now. The temperature will be almost perfect in May. It doesn't get too hot, not too cold yet in the evenings. So May and June a very good time to come. Just checking the ground for tracks, plenty of hyena activity during the night, going up and down here on our eastern boundary, so-called the cheetah cut line. I think there was a cheetah seen here in um, 1902. I'm being facetious, I have actually seen a cheetah on the cheetah cut line, believe it or not. giant cockroaches in this area. Gen B, and we don't show them on camera. Brian, have you ever seen a giant cockroach? Not yet. I've not seen a giant cockroach. I'm not sure that there is such a thing. The largest cockroach I've ever seen is about that big. It's about two inches across. That would be the very, very largest cockroach I've ever seen, and I think maybe I've seen two of them. So. Uh, we don't get very huge cockroaches here at all, GND, and that's why we wouldn't show them to you. Um, if we did find a giant cockroach, um, we'd absolutely try and film it because it would be very interesting. But there aren't huge cockroaches here. The closest relative to the cockroaches that we do show you, of course, are the termites, believe it or not. I have found the odd cockroach back at camp. Not so many in the bush, though. much action going on here on the cheetah cut line at the moment, but we just want to check if there aren't any leopard tracks coming to or from. Interesting question here from Lynn. We were watching that hearty dar eating the snake there and sort of deciding whether it was perhaps a venomous snake, or one of the burrowing asps as opposed to one of the blind snakes. And Lynn, you want to know, do snake, do birds know when a snake is venomous? I would say to within reason they probably do. I'm not sure how they would know. Uh, maybe there's a learned behavior. And certainly, I mean, there are lots of birds that specialize in snake killing. Uh, the 
the secretary bird being one, the lot, number of snake eagles out here being some of the others. And they will regularly take a, a venomous snake. I think what you'll find though, Lynn, is there are two aspects to this. Firstly, when a bird, a large raptor, kills a snake, remember, it doesn't always swallow it whole. It often will just eat the meat and kind of leave the head. And then if they do swallow it whole, remember that the venom is only effective. You can eat snake venom. If you don't have a cut or lesion in your esophagus or down into your stomach, the, your stomach acids will break up the proteins that make up that venom very quickly. It's the venom actually got to get into your blood or lymphatic system before it can have an effect. So to swallow a snake's head, for example, in a venomous snake can be completely harmless, especially if you have a very strong stomach digestion. So I think I would say my answer, Lynn, in a very roundabout way, which is normally a way of saying I don't actually know, but I'm guessing, and that's what's happening here, is I would say no, they don't know the difference. To within reason. That's called hedging the bits. Let's head across to Scott. He's got some updates on those lions, and I'll keep driving up here and keep you posted as to what we find Sorry, here. So we have now turned around, as I'm sure James told you, the Inca Homa Pratt somehow managed to make it across to Arethusa. They were east of our eastern boundary one day, the next day they were west of Juma's western boundary. So how they managed to get this far, I guess, is probably solely down to the fact that the rain completely washed away whatever tracks they left behind them, therefore giving us no idea as to where they could be. So basically, they, they were seen sometime last night off to our right on the Sibambili Arethusa cut line. Um, so we're just going to check this road to see if they haven't come back onto Juma. Failing that, we may decide either James or myself to go into Arethusa. Only one of us is allowed across there at any given time, which is just the traversing agreement that is in place. And for those of you who are new to the safari experience, basically, uh, it's a free-for-all for the animals. They can go wherever they like, but for good reason, the humans are contained or not contained, uh, assigned certain areas that they can drive in and that's simply to make sure that any one area does not become over congested which is hugely important to not overcrowd people's safari experiences less is more when it comes to other vehicles when on safari so that's just that I haven't heard any updates on the Arethusa Game Drive channel yet. What? What are you? As you can hear, it's not very clear. So I'm just waiting to get a little bit closer to the action, closer to the guys there, and that way we should be able to hear them a little bit more clearly on the radio. This road here, is the Sibambili Arethusa cut line. So the lions are lying somewhere down on this road. Where they've gone from here, I'm not sure. We either wanted them to go south onto Arethusa. If they'd have gone north back up to the right of that road, that would mean they're on Sibambili where we where we cannot go. But certainly good prospects, and at least somebody worked out where they were yesterday, because now we can fine-tune our search for them. Hello to Love Three Dogs, and querying or just further investigating my comment that just about all wild animals will be fed on uh, to varying degrees by the various tribes and local people that live in Africa and you inquiring to whether endangered species are permitted to be fed on. No, they are not. But the biggest problem with 
conserving African wilderness areas is that they are often very large and expansive. And the larger any wilderness area is, obviously more difficult it comes, becomes to police. So you find a lot of tribes and people living, as they did many, many years ago, that may not necessarily be getting the updates on the latest laws and the latest uh, population updates regarding the various animals. So you can't really blame them. They're almost none the wiser, and all they're trying to do is exist as they did many years ago. So, um, yes, of course, the uh, more educated uh, local people in more built-up African countries, like South Africa is a good example. We are far more developed than a lot more of the African countries that surround us and therefore have got better systems in place. Maybe the word gets spread a little bit better. So that's something important to remember. But again, there are lots of hungry, desperate people in this country that either don't get the updates as to what the rules are because they live in simply too remote a location. Well, even if they did know the rules, they are not in a position where they can actually afford to survive without doing whatever it takes to, to get whatever food they can. Generally, though, I think uh, the good news is, is that, you know, the endangered species, uh, you know, ones that come to mind for me, cheetah, wild dog, you know, the, the better known endangered species aren't going to be prey that are typically sought out after. And what I meant by the fact that just about anything would be fed on is that there are certain people that may have the use for uh, an abnormal animal to eat, like a leopard or a vulture, you know. It's not that they are a household delicacy, but more special medicines that are concocted using various parts of those specific animals. So I hope that helps to answer your question a little bit. Um, uh, morning, Valerie, you would like to know what Sibambili means. I don't know. James is going to be the right person to ask for that. He is our local Shangan or Chitsonga expert. Sibambili. To bamba is to catch, but Sibambili. We have captured, this posi is plural, um, gi, N-G-I is singular. Si would mean plural, meaning we. And then to bamba is to catch, to bambile uh, means have caught, but that's with an E on the end, not an I on the end. This is Sibambili not Sibambile. So, I don't know, let's ask James, but the spelling is S-I-B-A-M-B-I-L-I. What I'll do once the radio comes a little bit clear, clearer, I'll ask one of the Sibambili guides, Doug or Tristan. Failing that, I will ask one of the local Shangan guides that are driving around. I think I did hear Roy on the radio. So that is something we will be able to try and work out. But for now, Angstuf, which in Shangan means I don't know. in Arizona, you are interested, out of all the wild animals that you can feed on, all the venison, um, which is the tastiest? And I guess, like most things, uh, Chris, it'll depend on who you ask. Uh, for me, they're all varying degrees of tasty, but like most wild animals, uh, they require very careful preparation and also cooking. It's not as easy to cook a venison fillet as it is to cook a beef fillet, which is generally a lot more fatty, which makes it softer and generally tastier to eat. 
wild game is often very lean and requires to be matured and marinated and also cooked very well. Um, so for me it all depends on the chef and the preparation. You cannot feed on an animal that has been recently killed like uh, lions do. Often you'll hear of our beef being well matured, aged steaks, and that helps to break down the meat and make it more tasty. And it's the same for venison. If it's been cured properly, that is also an important part of the process. But all of the wild game that I have fed on has been tasty, as long as it's been prepared well. In South Africa, we've got a big culture of feeding on the dried meat of animals, as, as the American audience would know it as jerky, is what you call it, we call it biltong, B-I-L-T-O-N-G. Um, and again, a lot of venison as well as beef will be cured and that way basically just dried with salt and spices and vinegar. A tasty delicacy that we enjoy snacking on just about any time, but especially if you've got friends around or you're watching sports. Okay, still no updates. I'm gonna see if I can't get an update from the guys here now. Morning guys, uh, Scott here. Just confirming the Nkumas were seen on Sibambili Arathusa cut line yesterday. Uh, Scotty, morning Butch. Um, we have them at Sibambili Dam. Oh, well done Doug, thank you for putting us out of our misery. Uh, could you also confirm what exactly Sibambili means please? Um, Sibambili is a made up word made up by a couple of directors uh, in Johannesburg. It's a mix of two different languages, and uh, I think it's a Swahili uh, for lion and Mbili, which is uh, the Tonga or uh, Bantu for two. <laughs> okay, copy that. Makes sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it all makes perfect sense. Once you understand that, the people involved in making up this name combined a Kiswahili word, Simba for lion, and Mbili meaning two, the place of two lions. Today they've got five lions. It would be Simba Tano. No, Tano is five in Swahili. I don't know what it is in Zulu. It could also be something similar. Swahili uh, and is a Bantu language, as are a lot of the Southern African languages, like Shitsonga, like Isizulu. Um, so some words are exactly the same here. In Bili, in Zulu, and Shangan, and Swahili are all the same. It means two. In Nyama is also the same throughout, but other words can be drastically different, and as a whole, the languages, even though they're all Bantu, are very different. So there we go, the place of two lion, yet today there are five there, the Nkuhuma lioness. Um, they're a little bit far from our eastern boundary. Well done to Rich Smith, who cracked the code and worked out that Sibambili does mean two lion. Those guys will be really happy. Shame a lot of the guides to the west of us have been really battling for lion over the last couple of weeks. So I'm happy that the Nkuruhuma lioness have headed across there to give some of the other guides some breathing space with their guests. We'll have our turn again. <laughs> that is hilarious. Little Marjorie in Texas. Um, you would like to know if I've fed on any of the large birds of this area. Um, the game birds uh, of South Africa are all birds that you are typically going to be feeding on if you would like to. 
are the chicken-like animals like the Franklin and the guinea fowl, which are fed on both. Again, if prepared correctly, very tasty. Interestingly enough, and this is going to take a lot of you by surprise, a guinea fowl has got red meat. It's not a white meat like a chicken. Isn't that a surprising fact? Um, But yes, uh, kidney fowl and Franklin are the main birds that I've fed on. Um, others, I can't think of any others, but typically uh, it would, it, it's not frowned upon to feed on the other birds, but they just generally, it's generally not done. Anything smaller and or bigger and different like the storks, you know, those animals are not, are not fed on because I guess their populations together with their taste don't make sense for us to, to feed on them. So basically the chicken like, the chicken looking birds, the Franklin and the guinea fowl are the two that I have fed on. Oh, ostrich of course. Ostriches are commercially farmed bird that is fed on. Very popular, you can buy it in just about every single supermarket that you go into these days. Again, it's like most wild animals, it's lean um, and healthy for you. I'm not sure, I mean, I guess like most things in life, you have to understand where the supply is coming from. There, there's a movement uh, of people that uh, suggest by eating wild animals, you're having a less of a negative impact on uh, the environment and on the planet because you'll find that domestic animals uh, and or generally commercially farmed animals will be fed foods it's not uh, sustainable it will require wild bush like this to be torn up and fresh pastures planted that need to be irrigated in order to feed them having a much bigger footprint uh, per kilogram of meat than it would be to feed on wild animals. And I, I agree with that. Um, then you get the ostrich, which is a wild animal, not necessarily living in the wild, being farmed commercially, um, could be getting fed, you know, unorganic food, so therefore not as healthy as it would be if they were feeding organically on wild vegetation. So you get these kind of interesting gray areas, I guess, on that topic. Okay, we've just got a radio call through from Louise at the Juma Research Camp. And there are some monkeys alarm calling there, so hold on tight, we're a couple of minutes away and we need to get there quickly. If we can find out what these monkeys are shouting at, we may have our morning sorted. Could well be a leopard there, maybe Karula, the queen of Juma. But we need to be able to see where they are looking in order to be able to try and have a chance of finding whatever predator is there. Yee -hee. Hold on, everybody. I oh, know we've lost Brian. Only kidding. <laughs> Still on this channel? Okay, either way, can't get a hold of Louise, it, it appears, but let's just try and get there as soon as we can and try and work out for ourselves where exactly these monkeys are. You'll probably find that Louise can just cheer them. She can't necessarily see them, which is fine. Nothing like a little Ferrari safari to get the blood pumping early in the morning. Bug nearly whacked me in the eye there. It hit very close, so I got lucky. I was also fortunate that it wasn't the biggest of, of bugs. The last thing you want when you're speeding along like this is to have a dung beast or something wallop you in the eye. These are not 
lot of speed bumps that we're going over, is, even though that's what they may appear to be at this stage, they are to prevent water runoff building up, and it just directs it off the roads. Good news, James is also rushing into the area. Now I'm guessing it's the monkeys that live in and around the Vuyatela camp. I'm just going to stop here for a quick listen. Oh, I think I can maybe see a monkey in that tree there at about 10 o'clock. Something big and dark. No, that's a go away bird. Those are the go away birds we can hear shout, calling out. Quang. Let's continue. I can't hear any monkeys from here. So let's try and get a little bit closer to the DRC. Uh, I'm going to go back onto our game drive channel for this area. Where should we go? Should we go there? No, let's, let's get here. We've worked out where the monkeys are around pulling. I'll maybe be able to give James a better idea of where to head and we can combine our efforts in the search. The tricky thing with the monkey alarm calling is that it could be watching something 500 meters away or even as far as a kilometer away. Here's the little turn off to the Juma research camp, so let's go down here. Let's see if we can't hear any monkeys. I would suggest keeping an eye out at the Juma waterhole camera. Lucy, you are already keeping an eye out on the Juma waterhole camera, so thank you for that. And you said there's nothing there just yet. Okay. Um, Huh. It's tricky business uh, trying to f search for animals around the lodge. Obviously, there's a lot of infrastructure that prevents us from uh, driving we're exactly where we want to. And there's not also roads. So we're going to have to do a big loop around. I'm going to get a hold of James quickly. It's James for Scott. James, uh, no further alarm calls that I can hear. Uh, we're in some part outside the DRC. I'm going to take the Gallego waterhole road, road down to the dam. Copy. The station just reports of some monkeys alarm calling around the antenna. James and I are going to follow up on um, Also, the Nkuhumas are Sibambili Dam. Um. Okay, so just updating everyone there, making some plans. Now that James knows which direction we are going to be checking in, he's going to come across from the other side. And you can race around as much as you like. Oh, there it goes, the woodland. Woodlands Kingfish, I was hoping to show you. Um, it's a tricky situation, this. Do we rush around and cover as much ground as possible, or do we rather drive somewhere in the general area that we know we could at least hear some more alarm calls and wait? Because you can hear a lot further than you can see. That is why it is often best to stop and listen. Obviously, you've got to be confident in the in terms of the location of where you stopped. You don't want to be too far away from the action, but we know any, if we stop at the Gallagher Water, which is what I'm thinking we're gonna do, we are in close proximity to where Louise heard those monkeys alarm calling from. You can hear them calling from about easily 500 meters away. Let's maybe wait there. 
and see what's happening. Thankfully, James is already at the Juma Water, which is also a good place to be right now. So why don't you jump on his vehicle and try and find whatever it is these bunkies are shouting at. We're just at the dam, as Scott said, everybody. Sorry about that noise on the radio there. Um, the monkeys, of course, were calling behind the camp over there. And if you can there, just see, and quite often, if this is a Karula or another leopard that lives around here, i.e. Tangana or Vula, they would come through this kind of bushy area along the drainage line, perhaps pop up to have a drink here, or just melt away into that riverine bush on the western side of the camp, eastern side of the camp. I don't see anything here. I'm looking with my very powerful binoculars. Last used, of course, by Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. Um, I think what we're going to do is turn around and just drive sort of towards where Scott is. The camp is in the way, of course. I can hear some alarm-calling grey go-away birds, but sometimes they just shout at each other. We must just watch carefully here. And as we know, the lions are at Sibambili, so quite likely that this is a leopard, unless it's a male lion, which would be quite interesting. Well, it would be fascinating and quite interesting. Let's just pop up this way. Now, unfortunately, of course, the area to the north of the Gallagher waterhole where Scott is heading now is, well, I mean, it's undrivable. So if we do find something in there, it's probably going to be a very short sighting. But with any luck, we will find sitting upon some hapless piece of prey which will then devour in front of our eyes. Hold on, David. Now, we did come from Bifflesook Dam when we got reports of these monkeys yelling. I'm just going to turn the radio back up so I can hear what's going on in case Scott tries to hail me. And we drove here at a great speed with great enthusiasm to see if we couldn't find what was causing the consternation in the monkeys, but we haven't seen anything yet. And I certainly haven't found there was nothing at Bivles of Dam, everyone. It was quite full of water, though, which is quite nice. So during the hot times next week, Now, apparently, Scott is at the Gallagher pan. You can see a monkey in the camp, but it's looking very relaxed with life. It's about to tuck into some bacon and eggs. So not obviously very terrified at the moment, which means that whatever was causing the trouble has flown off. What I did see as I flew, as we drove in here was an eagle flying over. They're not very, I mean, the monkeys to here don't normally alarm called eagles because there aren't any monkey-eating species of eagle normally. Maybe it was that. It may have been a python. They don't like pythons at all, monkeys, because pythons are like monkeys. So we'll just drive very slowly up here. Looking, this is the bush that I was pointing out to you on the left-hand side here. It provides ideal cover for a predator. and just have a listen. A question from Kath, I think. Yeah. Kath, Kath Tamira or Kath in Tamira. Um, you want to know about uh, Kath and Tamira. You want to know how fast these vehicles can go while we listen to see if we can hear some alarm calls. You hear a woodpecker smashing his head against a tree. Um, cat, not very fast anymore. Um, it is it used to be quite a fast car. I mean, the engine in it was the same as the old 328, the um, BMW 328. 
But these days, you know, age and wear and tear has taken their toll, and it's geared not to go very fast. But they're perfectly fast enough for this area. I haven't seen Karula up that far. Um, so I've got no more alarm calls, or we've got no more alarm calls. Everything seems to be very relaxed. Let's do one more little trip up here. And then if we come up with nothing here, we'll go back around over the dam towards quarantine and see if perhaps whatever it was hasn't gone back that way. And if it is, for example, Karula, she does often, she, she kind of goes through that area, that thick block where the monkeys were calling, and she can then head north and then across to the east, or she will often then go on to quarantine clearings. shouting, no monkeys shouting. All is peace. Okay, Scott is going to pop out of that road over there, so I'm going to turn around right here. He will check that road there. Anything pops out. Okay. Tracks, like I say, leading into Bivelshoek Dam, uh, nothing at Bivelshoek Dam itself. So all was quiet on the eastern front this morning. And it's not to say that there won't be something around there. Now, Ava, while we're driving along, I believe you've been having a bit of a discussion with Scott about uh, what animals people eat and then, of course, the names of the lodges and what they mean. And, Ava, you want to know about the local people here and how many are there? Well, Ava, there are probably at least six million people, believe it or not, living on the borders of the Greater Kruger National Park. Now, that's a substantial number of human beings. And most of them, well, kind of, you can divide it up. In the south, there would be Swazi-speaking people. In the middle and northern regions, there would be um, Shangan or Tsonga-speaking people, and that's most of the people out here. In the far north, there would be Venda-speaking, Shivenda, which is an almost impossible language to learn. Um, and it's quite interesting, it's totally unrelated to many of the South African, all the South African languages. And then there's also a pocket of Pedi or Northern Sutu speakers, and of course, that's where Arathusa gets its name from. It's a Pedi name. It's the only Pedi name lodge around here. So those are the people, about six million people on the borders of the Kruger Park, as far as I know. And they all live in little rural villages, some of them very attractive, some of them fairly poverty-stricken and dust-riddled. Kate, you're in San Francisco and you're asking about how the Shangan people or the local people are coping with the drought. And the answer, Kate, is with great difficulty. The closer to the park they are, the less rain there's been. Um, some of the communities live quite close to the mountains. They've had okay rain this year, but those living around where we are have had a really tough time. Now, a lot of the water comes from wells, which means water is going to be much more irregular than it is normally. No one's got piped water to their homes, so that's a problem for them. Their cattle, in which most of their, or a lot of their wealth is invested, uh, are really struggling. The grazing is not good out there at the moment, and so the cattle are really struggling. So that's a, that's a real difficulty for local people here. And remember, I mean, there's an unemployment rate in many of the areas of up to 70%. That is a quite astonishing statistic. And everyone with a salary is supporting between six and ten people. Okay, Scotty is going around the way to get tele-access, so that's perfect. He's basically doing a pincer movement around this area. And if there was a predator, and if she or he wishes to show us her or himself, we will be in a position to see her or him. Right. 
So there's the dam, or not the dam, the pan. And we'll just drive gently up onto quarantine theory. Now, Eric, you want to know if Tonga is the same as Shangan. Um, not really. Tonga, I suppose, would be the overarching language, and it's spoken all the way into Mozambique. But not all Tongas would consider themselves Shangans. The Shangans were a, an offshoot of the Tongas, and they actually it was an amalgamation of a fairly large clan of Zulus and the Tonga-speaking people. And what I find so fascinating about that story is that the a chap called Manu Korsi, who was an Ndwandwe chieftain, which was a Zulu chieftain, was a Zulu clan, who took offense to Shaka in the 1820s. Shaka, of course, was the great Zulu king or military leader. Some might say a um, vicious dictator and murderer. Um, we'll leave that for another day. And Manu Korsi came up the, north, the eastern coast of South Africa, went into Mozambique, and it was, he was largely a group of male warriors, obviously, and not many retainers. They were kind of running from Shaka. And they then assimilated a whole lot of Tsonga-speaking groups where there wasn't a kind of, it wasn't a very centralized authority that they had. And what is interesting to me is that instead of those Tsonga-speaking peoples absorbing the Zulu language of their conquerors, if you like, the conquerors absorbed the conquered language of Shitsonga. And apparently what happens in a situation like this is that because most of the offspring of the conquered spend time around the women, the women are, of course, Tsonga speakers. And so what happens is that the, the male, the, when you have these situations where great groups of male warriors or armies come into an area and take over, what you happen is that they, see, it seems to happen is that they lose the language. And that's why the Tsongas, or the Shangas, who were the offshoot of that initial conquering, there is a little speaks hinged tortoise on the road. So that is why those originally conquered peoples still speak Shangan. And they, Manu Korsi took on the name Soshangane, which I'm not sure why he took it on. I think it was from a river somewhere around where they were. And that is how the Shangans got their name. So basically, in a long-winded and roundabout way, the Shangans are a group of Tonga-speaking peoples. Phew! What's a long explanation. There you go, Eric. Sorry about that. And that is a speaks hinged tortoise. He's a, an indecisive speaks hinged tortoise. Oh, this is just massive interaction going on here. David, pan to the left quickly. We seem to have. No, 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 that's far enough. Whoa, there we go. Look, look at that. Oh, they've missed each other. Now, the speaks hinged tortoise is known to eat the pill millipede. That is not a pill millipede, that's a worm like millipede. You can see he's not vaguely interested in it. Phew, David, did you see that was I mean, amazing action there? Two of the speed demons of the Lofelt there in a headlong collision. Phew, could have been ugly. <laughs> you managing to keep up with that one, Dave? The speedy, speedy animal. Okay, let's leave him alone. We're on quarantine clearings. Ava, well, there seem to be a, lots of concern these today about enormous insects. Um, you want to know about the, whether there are giant millipedes here. No, no giant millipedes. That's about as big as they get, actually. And that one was about that size, so about four inches long. We will get them up to six inches, but no, that's about as large as they get. Um, I imagine that in some of the forested areas of Africa, um, perhaps in Gabon, you may well find much larger examples of millipedes. And in fact, that's where you will find the biggest insects would be in rainforests. And of course, a millipede is an eater of dead and dying plant matter. So in a big forest, you'll find there'll be lots for a millipede to eat, and therefore they'll get much bigger. I'm just looking at the ground here to see what grasses have managed to flush out of quarantine clearings. And I see not much yet. 
A lot of the forms of the pioneer plants have come up again and flushed again. There are some grass plants, though, and I think with a bit of heat and sun come next week, we'll find that the grass sward on quarantine might be replaced somewhat. Remember that there's a seed bed always. The soil here will contain masses and masses of seeds. And so even though the plants themselves might be pulled out and eaten by desperate grazers, once the rains come back and there's sufficient sun, those seeds will germinate and replace what has been taken out. David, can you feel the uh, precipitation? Mm, it's a very fresh precipitation coming out of the sky. And we have not seen, of course, anything that has caused the consternation of the monkeys. We're going to go around and just do another loop where Scott was. Well, let's head back to Scott. He's just over there. I'm going to go back around towards the Gallagher waterhole and we'll keep you posted. Well, happy to hear that James is going to head back to the water. We're kind of moving into the area that he's in now. Just checking now for any sign of tracks. Hoping that that may be able to lead us closer to where whatever this threat that the monkey saw is. We did see a monkey. It looked like a female holding a little baby. It was far away from us. But she was looking to the northwestern side of the camp. But we only saw her looking in that direction for a very short space of time before she came down from the tree. Didn't hear one alarm call. So now I'm just checking close to the camp. You can see the perimeter fence that surrounds the Gallagher camp. Karula will often skirt around this perimeter fence through these areas. We've had her moving in the flesh. I've also seen her tracks moving in this area quite a few times. Uh, and then uh, so we obviously didn't race here fast enough. The monkeys had already stopped alarm calling, which makes things difficult. It's tough enough, even if you come across an animal while it still is alarm calling, for the mere fact that you do not know where these animals may be. The monkey may be sitting in a tree very close to where you may be or where you may see the monkey, but it can see far away. I mean, if we were a monkey here, parked at the top of a tree, you can see far, five, six hundred meters. And if they're alarm calling at a leopard all the way across that valley, which they can see, and you race to the tree that the monkeys are sitting in, even though you may see which direction they're looking in, it still doesn't make life easier. That coupled with the fact that any predator who does start being alarmed at will tick or typically try and slink away to prevent any further attention being attracted to it so this may be an unsolved mystery or james may get lucky as he heads back into the area where i think he could get lucky Be short, you have apparently seen a herd of animals making their way towards the water hole, and we've just seen them now. It's a bachelor herd of Inyala. Hello, everyone, on the Jim Water Hole camera, which we've just passed. And here are the boys that Be Short spotted. All different shapes and sizes. The one in front. Looks to be the biggest and the oldest, and then it's almost in perfect size and age, working their way from biggest to smallest, from right to left. Brian and I also did keep still for about five to ten minutes, hoping that by being stationary, we would be rewarded by some further alarm calls, maybe from a different species, maybe not monkey, maybe Franklins, squirrels, Antelope like these and Yala, which have a dog-like bark. Pa, pa. Oh, is it playtime? Looks like you want to get some mud on your horns and then possibly 
have a little wrestling match with your counterpart there. Come on. Why don't you show us exactly how Inyala trained to be big and nasty one day. Not big and nasty, but it is important that they understand how to fight with one another. It is also interesting how Inyala will, and other antelope will rub their horns in the ground. It will be to try and alleviate parasites that could be trying to bore into them, or purely just a display. Looks like he's gonna get involved here in this bush as well. They'll take out their anger and aggression on small shrubs from time to time. No, it looked like that was a snack. Maybe if James just switches off wherever he is, uh, Kirsty. There seems to be another alarm call kicking up. I'm not sure what it was. Brian also heard something, possibly a monkey. Um, hard to tell exactly what it was, but we did hear a strange noise. So I think James is a little bit closer towards where that noise came from. And that's why it will just be useful for him to be stationary in his vehicle, which he is now. I can't hear any further noises. You can just hear the virtual starling calling nearby to us. We can actually see it. So, Brian, let's have a, have a look at that as it calls. It's wonderful to try and show you the animals that are making the noise, not just telling you about it. And it's just sitting on a dead stump over to our right. There was a zoom of what's all camera you would have got a glimpse of before Brian zoomed in. OK, thank you. You can keep singing. Let's just stop and listen for a few moments. It's just a few virtual starlings that I can hear calling. Oh, Brian, here comes something, I think. Is it flying straight towards us or straight away from us? And uh, is it coming? I think it is coming towards us along the road. No, it was flying away. Sorry, false alarm. There was an Egyptian goose. I thought it was going to be flying straight towards us here. It would have been an awesome sequence to film, but it was flying in exactly the opposite direction, making it disappear and be far from awesome. It was nothing. Uh, I think we should carry on now. No further alarms. I'm not sure what that noise was, but it was certainly worth investigating. All right. I think I'm thinking of turning around and going back the direction we've come. Well, it's just a different loop around the other side of FC. Hello, Aileen and R. Beard, who are both wondering about how monkeys move about and how often they will leave tracks on the sand. Um, they will move on the ground every single day of their life. They, there's not enough of a, a canopy interconnecting all the trees in this area, so they would, they, it would be impossible for them to survive without touching the ground. So yes, we do see their tracks. They will also forage on the ground, not only up in the trees, but like I say, the way you can see how sparsely vegetated the trees are, unlike a jungle, um, it would be impossible for them to survive only moving from tree to tree. They would be marooned, essentially, in a small island of food. So yes, we do see their tracks from time to time. They look fairly similar to a, a, a human hand, I guess. 
Their feet are different to our feet. Their toes are a little bit longer. Um, and their big toe is more of a thumb. So their, their feet look more like uh, our hands do. Our hands and our feet are hugely different because we've evolved to walk on our feet, whereas they are still walking on all fours. So different foot structure, very similar hand structure to us, and their hand is their foot is more like a hand. If I see any tracks, I will be sure to show you. to know if the predators are aware of what exactly an alarm call is yes certainly they know that when a monkey or a squirrel or a go away bird starts alarm calling it at it uh, the word is out they get frustrated I've even seen leopard in certain scenarios once they have set off the alarm uh, of whatever animal it may be they'll let out their loud rasping <laughs> Almost like we would be cursing, shouting and screaming if we were, got, were frustrated by something. Uh, the leopard will also shout and scream. They're disgusted by letting out their vocalization, saying, Sherbet, we've been seen. Um, so yes, they know what it means, they know the repercussions thereof, and they will typically, like I said a little bit earlier, try and slink away from any alarm calls. And it sounds like you guys may be lucky enough to see some alarm calls right now with the grey go-away bird and a brown snake eagle. to do. Okay. No, I don't think this is what the monkeys were alarm calling at everybody, but there is a grey go-away bird alarm calling at what is a very uh, sprightly looking brown snake eagle. We were chatting about the snake eagles earlier and that is one of them. Uh, the brown version. Of course the most commonly asked question is do they eat brown snakes? To which the answer is of course they do. But do you think the black-breasted snake eagle eats only black-breasted snakes? Which is of course not the case. Now what they have is slightly shortened toes, those brown snake eagles, so that they can grip their prey without getting bitten. They don't want to kind of have toes that are too long and not quite able to grab the prey, and then they find themselves with some fangs in the midriff, which of course is very inconvenient if you happen to be a snake-eating bird. Then the luri, or the go grey go away bird, is just in this buffalo thorn tree over there. There it flies. And that, when I originally heard it calling like that, I thought maybe it was shouting at a leopard or something ground-based, but then we saw the big eagle over there. And while that is a snake-eating e eagle, it will take small birds as well. Okay, what we're going to do from here is to just meander gently up this next road, which is called a Vubu Road, and head towards the hyena den. I can hear a little bit of squirrel alarm calling through there. Now, squirrels alarm call at just about anything, and so I'm not really convinced that they've necessarily seen anything too dire, especially as there's a herd of very sleepy-looking impala up ahead on the road. But let's just ease our way up here, go and check on things at the den, and we'll make a plan from there. There's a squirrel alarm calling. Hmm? Worth just stopping and listening. Not a very enthusiastic alarm call, it was just one. And silent. Maybe whatever it was alarm calling at. Has eaten it. Okay, I think very good idea. Scott is going to recheck the road we've just checked because I think uh, something's going on here. There's the squirrel alarming. 
The impala's heads have turned up, picked up, one or two of them have. That's, you know what, that squirrel would also alarm call at the snake eagle, though. I think that's what's going on. I think that's exactly what the squirrels are shouting at. Let's carry on. Slowly steering into the undergrowth, just for in case. This little nursery herd of impala all round over here, both sides of the road, very relaxed. Tampa, as we look at this impala herd, uh, you ask a question that is um, an interesting one. You are very kindly taken upon yourself to uh, give of your time and effort to read uh, a book that I wrote called A Year in the Wild. And in it, I relate the story of having to hunt an impala ram as a sort of final rite of passage as a young ranger. And you want to know if that was true. It, w it is true. And not all rangers have to do it, not all guides do it. Uh, but there's a very logical reason behind why I had to do it and why many guides do do it. I'm not a hunter. I don't enjoy hunting. I find the practice of trophy hunting to be, frankly, a totally distasteful activity, especially in 2016. That said, I've got no problem with people who hunt animals for food. But the main point of this thing was that, and we did eat the impala at the end, but the main point of it was that we trained with these rifles. And when you guide people on foot, you have to be able to shoot. But we shoot boxes. You know, you practice with boxes and you do all these drills and that sort of thing. You never actually take a life. And there's a ram that's, it sounds like an alarm call, but I think it was just a ram shouting at his females. Outdoors. He's chasing her through here. Anyway, so Cat, one of the major points of. Oh, he's very upset with her. He seems to have calmed now. Cat, one of the major points of it was to see are you able, with push came to shove, would you be able to pull the trigger in anger? And I think that's an incredibly important thing to have to, to learn about yourself if you are going to be guiding people in the bush on foot. And so that was one of the other re one of the reasons. And the other reason, of course, is that as you've seen, we follow predators around here. And you can't believe how difficult it is to get close enough to an animal to shoot it. And um, it was a really good way to, uh, for me to understand and for all guys to understand how difficult it is for the predators out here to survive. And so while we drive through here and sometimes, you know, you make a bit of a noise going through the bush, it certainly made me a lot more sensitive to how difficult it is for the predators out here to catch their prey. So there are a number of reasons that we did it. Some people, are, almost universally, people don't disagree with it. Um, but not everybody does it. And I found, for me, one of the most valuable experiences of my life. I'd come out of the city, I'd never hunted anything before, and it was a very valuable bush experience for me. I didn't like it, um, I found it very, um, I found it very emotionally draining, actually, as I, I think I described. No more alarm calls going on here at the moment, which is very irritating. David, you and I have got about as much luck as a thing that doesn't have a lot of luck. I think our luck's going to change. You think our luck's going to change? Good. Some water buck up ahead. exotic or strange thing I've ever eaten is. Um, all out here would have to be the um, famous Mapani worm. 
which is a caterpillar that grows on mopani trees, which we don't get here. It also grows on jackalberry trees that we get here. And it produces a very beautiful moth called the emperor moth, which is about that big. And the caterpillar itself is quite a spectacular black and red and orange and yellow affair. And uh, what you do is, if you're really brave, which I wasn't, you can take the raw mopani moth, squeeze its guts up, and then eat it straight like that. I was unable to bring myself to do that. Uh, normally what happens is you dry them in the sun for a while, and then you fry them up, and you can eat them. And they taste like sort of gamey sawdust. So not particularly, they taste like whatever you cook them in, basically. So if you cook them in a lot of salt, they'll just taste like sort of salty sawdust. If you put them in some tomato and onion relish, which is what a lot of people cook them with, then they'll taste like uh, chewy bits in some tomato and onion relish. But otherwise, they're not particularly flavorsome. And as I've said before, out here, people tend to talk about or ask about delicacies. You know, what local delicacies are there on the meal? Uh, we have escargot in uh, France and, you know, various other delicacies that occur around the world. And the answer is there aren't any. There are no real delicacies because, remember, this area is particularly nutrient poor. And that means the flavors that you get out here from even vegetables that you grow in the ground are, tend to be very bland. And so you don't find garlic here or lots of different herbs that could add flavor to food, which is exactly what gives flavor to food from, you know, the kind of great culinary nations of the world. There aren't a huge number of tasty fish. There, you can have catfish, which taste like mud, unless you clean them in clean water. And so while there's lots of nutrition to be had out here, it's not particularly flavorsome. And so something like a mapani worm, which has been billed as a local African delicacy, is actually just a really essential part of the protein required in the local diet. And to describe the taste of that worm as a delicacy would be to um, do an injustice, I feel, to all delicacies around the world. There are some hyenas here. Hooray. rattlesnakes in Texas. That sounds like an awful activity. Although I believe rattlesnakes taste like chicken. In fact, I think all snakes taste like chicken. Okay, let's assess who's here. That at the top there, I can see Corky right in front of the car, but that's not who we're looking at now. That's probably Madam up at the top. Very pretty. It is probably pretty. Madam is actually at the entrance there. She has had a massive, massive meal. I'm going to go a little bit forward so that David can see her. You see her there? That one there. Yes. I think that's pretty there. I guess it's a male. I don't think it's a male. That's Madam there lying at the entrance to the den, engorged. I'm no sounding a bit muffled. I'm not sure about that. How's that, Kirsten? Am I clearer now? How's that? But more? I think we're not going to get it much better than that, I'm afraid. Okay. Carol, you say is it warm here today? Um, no. Carol, it's not warm here today. I don't know who that hyena is, that other one, that other adult. It's not pretty. Looks like a much younger one. Looks like a be a young male. One of our experts will tell us, I've no doubt. Carol, it's not warm. It's about 23 degrees Celsius, which is about 71 degrees Fahrenheit. 
which, although it's not cold, of course, here's Corky right in front of us. Dave? And she's very obvious by the scars between her ears. Lots of activity going on here at the entrance to the den, all centered on the matriarch. And that young hyena who, no, I don't know who that is either. It's all rather confusing. All the youngsters are here, D1 and D2, J1 and J2. Where they'd be going at this time of the day. They've definitely eaten something last night. Something large has been consumed. They're all going down the road with the youngsters. Corky's taking her two youngsters with her. Let me just quickly turn around, sorry. going on a little foray. November is still at the den. The two Ds have gone off with Corky. Let's follow them. At a discreet distance. I'll be fascinated to know how far she's prepared to take them from the den. And then suddenly she's decided she's going to move. It is very niffy around here. It's starting to smell quite bad. But I think this is just a kind of a, a little foray, a little sort of wander about the place. I don't know who this is in front of us now. An experiential trip around. So I am getting some agreement here from Michelle and Chris Rogue who say that the male is the chap called Ribbon who was watched um, having a swim the other day with Sam. Now, you also say that he's not old enough to have dispersed yet. Remember, not all the males will disperse. Some of them will remain within the clan. They will then have very little chance of mating, of course. But some of them will remain in the clan. Thank you very much for that, Chris Rogue and Michelle. That's great stuff. It's exactly the kind of stuff that makes it such a wonderful job to be doing, because otherwise it would be impossible to identify all these hyenas. So for those of you who are watching for the first time, oh, here's a, little, here's a cub. I just heard some crunching around the place. One of the, there's the little D cub running back to the den. With a tail, <laughs> tail stuck out. I heard some crunching in here, and I wonder if there isn't. I wonder if they don't have a carcass here. I'll just keep an ear out. I can still hear them at the den going, oh, 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 oh. And if you are further interested in the hyenas, like I say, if you're a first time viewer, there's a very nice Facebook group called the Hyenas of Juma and Arethusa. If you want to learn the identi how to identify all of these different hyenas that we get here, that's probably your best bet. I've got individual pictures of each one. And there's the other hyena coming in now. And Astralina thinks we've caught them in the process of den moving. Astralina, I don't, I'm afraid. 
I think they're going back. I think there's meat here somewhere. I heard a crunching noise, which made me think that there was a carcass, perhaps, in the drainage line down here. So I'm going to stick my stick my nose in there and see if we can't see something down there. Oh, quick across to Scott. He's got something quickly exciting to show you. Well, this is an excellent view of a bird we don't get to often show you, the black-headed oriole. And I know things are very exciting across with James, but we couldn't resist this opportunity. I wonder what that chewing sound is. And I'm hoping you are going to get to see some interesting stuff shortly. Look at the bright, bright yellow coloration of this bird. Hard to mistake with any other bird of this area. I guess one thing it could be confused with is a weaver. But it's larger than that, and it's got that distinctively black head. Brian's doing an incredible job on camera, as well as that red beak that the weavers will lack. They've got a wonderful call the black-headed black oriole. This kind of my impersonation of it, not perfect. And a lot of you are mentioning how pretty this bird is, and yes, it is indeed one of the prettier of the feathered friends we see here at Juma. Oh, it looks like it made a kill. It's got a, a stick insect or a grasshopper. One or the two, it looks like a stick insect to me. Well, how on earth it spotted that stick insect, I do not know, because as their name suggests, they look just like sticks. Then it hopped up and quite easily now plucked that from its perch. Hard to believe that Angie in Wisconsin asked just a few moments ago about stick insects and whether we ever see them. We do usually in and around camp. I mean, the only time we spot them is when they are on man-made structures, which makes them a lot easier to spot. But usually when they are in their natural habitat, they blend in so well that only animals like the black-headed oriole can spot them. Has it swallowed it? Yeah. Gone, gobbled up. Maybe this will be the precursor, the starter, before seeing the hyenas chewing on something more sizey. You've got to see a black-headed oriole snacking on a stick insect. Very good. We will be sending you back to James. Good luck finding out what on earth is going on over there. Okay, we, I've stuck my nose over the top of the drainage line there. I can't see into it. It's too far away. There's no more crunching going on. But at least one of the cubs has run back to the den here. I think maybe a few others came around and back. So let's just go back and see what's going on there. Something was eaten last night. I just wonder if there isn't a, the ra remains of it somewhere around here. The smell of the den would indicate that it's not too far away. Right, we're reapproaching now from a different angle. Excuse the bumps. Now. 
That's D1, who's being moved around by the back leg. <laughs> being disciplined, very cross. I'm glad my mother didn't carry me around like that. Now, Corky is quite interesting. You can't see from there because she's behind the tree, but her teeth are actually quite blunt, which means she's not a young hyena. And the delicacy with which she's playing with her youngster is amazing because, of course, her jaws are unbelievably powerful. She could do immense damage immediately if she need, wanted to. Mm. Just above us is a fork-tailed zongo calling. That's the bird that you can hear. And it's imitating variously a woodland kingfisher, a brown-hooded kingfisher, and even a Franklin every so often. Isn't this wonderful? Suddenly there's just such peace and calm. sorry, who's being now groomed by her mother as opposed to dragged around by the leg, is the young female, Corky's daughter. Here comes, here comes the other one. That other one isn't D2, that other one's November. There's D2 just arriving back now. Unless I'm mistaken, maybe I've got them mixed up. I have got them mixed up, sorry. That's November, who's just arrived now. She was the one who went off. And it always amazes me how tolerant the matriarch is there. She's there with her two young youngsters of her own. And whenever the other youngsters come up towards her, she's completely tolerant of them. And here comes the other adult with whom November went away. I think this is pretty, you know. There she comes. And so that's November's mother, right? Mm, I don't know. What does everyone think? Who is this female? Keep her, she's either pregnant again or eaten herself to almost oblivion. And look at the size of her belly. Susan Guy, you say she reminds you of your fat aunt who never misses a Twinkie. I think we, we all have a Kevin, sorry, Kevin Guy reminds you of your fat aunt <laughs> who never misses a Twinkie. Well, I think that this hyena wouldn't miss a Twinkie either. I hope your aunt isn't watching, Kevin. I mean, she is, she is deeply engorged. I don't think that's pretty. You can just hear all the time those little contact calls, reaffirming social bonds, giving the odd warning, depending on the tone. Mm. Interestingly, that male that we saw here yesterday, or the day before, seems to have moved off. Now, 
Now, Carol, you want to know if these are the same hyenas seen on the Arethusa Dam cam last night? Um, almost certainly not, Carol. They are in their own territory, this clan, and I know Arethusa has another clan that occupies most of that area. So I would say almost certainly not. It's not impossible, though. I don't know how many were seen on the camera, and it's not impossible for males, especially from this clan, to go and make forays into a neighboring clan's territory to see what's happening there. But I'm almost certain that the females here would not have gone as far as Arethusa Dam, simply because it's into another clan's territory. But it's not impossible, but I'd say almost certainly not. <laughs> there he goes. Decided that he's had enough of the ladies and the children. Well, Aileen, I mean, Aileen, an exceptionally very good question. Um, how do you tell if a hyena is pregnant or just very fat? Aileen, it's not easy. But normally, it's the lactating that gives it away. So if she's lactating, then clearly, or she looks like she's going to start lactating, she's got swollen teats, normally it means that she's pregnant. Now, on that sort of subject, you want to know how often they give birth. They give birth probably to two cubs every three years, if you know if that makes sense. They, they wouldn't give birth in the same year. It would be highly unlikely for them to give birth within the same year. So once every 18 months or so, they can fall pregnant. So if that is pretty, and I don't think it is, she doesn't look nearly pretty enough to be pretty, um, she wouldn't be pregnant again. But I might be wrong. I'd love to know from any of you. That very large hyena walking out of frame now. Do you think that's pretty, or is that another female that's arrived here? Kirsten thinks pretty. So it could be pretty, just a very fat version after a big meal. And Pretty will still be lactating, of course, because her daughter was only born in November. And they have a six-month weaning period. Up to a year, sometimes. <laughs> What's going on here? I think we're only coming to the very beginnings of our understanding of hyena society. <laughs> very valid question here. Mohammed, you want to know why is a hyena a clan and a lion group a pride? Why should there be a difference? Um, Mohammed, I don't know the answer to that question. I couldn't really tell you. Save to say that I think it's a naming convention that has something to do with language and something to do with biology. So a lot, as with a lot of the naming conventions here. A hyena, of course, is not related to, not very closely related to a cat. It's even more distantly related to a dog. And so I think it's just be been decided a while back the hyena group should be called a clan because it isn't related to a pride. The structure is completely different as well. Likewise, a dog, of course, is in a pack, not a clan or a pride. So, very nice question there, Mohammed. I think it's probably got a lot to do with simply the early biologists deciding that these should be the terms that are given to these animals. And often, in if the local languages, there's no difference between the, the words. So you'd use the same word for a group of hyenas as you would for a herd of buffalo, for example. But in English, it tends to be different. And then, of course, you get those ridiculous, endless 
collective nouns that people sprout, like dazzles of zebras and journeys of giraffes and parliaments of owls and murders of crows and those sorts of things, which are not biological terms at all. So when in doubt, if it doesn't eat meat, it's a herd. And if it's a meat-eating group, well, we've got a pack for dogs, a clan for hyenas, and pride for lions. Thank you, Mohammed. Great question. Now, Lisa, you're on YouTube and you're a new viewer, and it's wonderful to have you along. Thank you, A, for giving us of your time, and B, for sending us a question. Great stuff. You want to know, do they need to eat every day? No. These fatties who've just eaten themselves into oblivion last night won't need to eat for at least two or three days, if not more. So they certainly don't need to eat every day. These, it just depends on what they have to eat. So completely unlike a human being who, I mean, we could probably get away with eating once a day and maintain our weight. I know that we tend to eat about seven times a day, most of us, but we could get away with having one big meal once a day and survive quite happily. We couldn't, however, have one big meal every two or three days because we don't have the digestive systems to cope with that amount of food in one sitting, which is what these hyenas do. Hyenas and lions and leopards also, to a certain extent, are able to eat a massive amount of food. This is interesting. Now oh, that must be pretty then. That's November suckling from her, so it must be pretty. Good. So she's not pregnant, everyone. She's just lactating and massively obese after an enormous meal. Okay, from a clan, we're gonna go across to a troop at another den. Oh, hello everyone. My earpiece obviously decided to stop working, so I didn't know we were live there. Welcome. There's some dwarf mongooses playing about here, and there's all different shapes and sizes, which is a wonderful thing about the sightings we've been having of them recently. There's a youngster there on the right. You can see the youngsters are about half the size of the adults. And this whole termite mound is bustling with these dwarf mongooses running all around. There's many different entrance tunnels into the termite mound. That's where they're all playing about. There's one perch right at the top now. Maybe the sentry keeping an eye out on the rest of the troop, making sure that there are no possible threats in being such a small animal. They are predated on by all manner of creatures, but mainly the birds of prey. Looks like they're foraging for breakfast, looking for little insects to snack on. This one's got a really steep portion of the mine. It's going to be interesting to see it navigate its way from here. There's a few brine that are running up from left to right now. They've come from elsewhere. Oh, there's a youngster. Look at it, half the size of its mom. Look at how cool this is. And we've got a very nice playground. It's incredible once you do spend some time with them, you see them appearing from just about everywhere all around us. This seems like quite a large troop. Brian, there's a youngster on our left here. It's very, oh, it just ran off, but it was coming quite close to us. I think it still is going to be worth trying to get it. Here it is. I don't know what it's chasing after, but it's definitely hunting something. Let's keep a close eye on this one because it is the closest to us. Maybe it's trying to hunt a grasshopper or something small. It is a youngster. Oh, morning. How are you? Oh. They don't like being greeted, clearly. Brian's found another good opportunity here. Oh, it looks like that mother just finished chewing on something. Hard to tell what exactly. Oh, settle down, a wrestling match. Sure, they are quick.
Paul Bryan on the road in front of us. Some tiny little blue wax balls. Come back out, they've just disappeared behind that green. Oh no, there's one to the right in the center of the road. Where'd it go? Oh, here it is. This is such a cool little bird. It's one of my favorites, the blue wax ball. It is minute. So at least we got you a quick view of that. And now I've looked up and can't see a mongoose in sight. Oh, well done, Brian. Another view of the wax ball. Perched in a silver cluster leaf. I've been hoping that we're going to be able to find you the nests of these birds. They're very clever with regards to where they nest. They will often build their little nest just above a vespid wasp nest, making it treacherous for any animals to try and steal the eggs or chicks from within this, that, their nest. So they basically have their own private security system. And I remember last summer we managed to find you quite a few of the nests, but this year we haven't been as lucky. I don't think we've even managed to find one so far. Well, just like that, the dwarf mongooses appear to have temporarily disappeared. I know it looks like some more members are moving from left to right towards the round. Now, Jerry in Illinois, you've noticed that you've seen very large animals, zebra, even elephants, standing on these termite mounds. Such important structures in the African wilderness because they do provide homes for certain animals like this, good feeding for other animals like elephants and zebra because the upturned soil, you could say, that is put in place by the termites themselves create for very lush vegetation and good growing conditions. So animals like elephants and all the herbivores basically will often actively feed around termite mounds and you surprised by the fact that they can withstand their weight. And it is, it's fascinating that tiny creatures, tiny little insects, the termites, what are you digging for there? Tiny little termites can use just their saliva together with the mud around them and sand around them to create such solid structures. And I guess that's all it is. It's the termites and their engineering, which requires only the basic, most basic of ingredients, saliva from them, as well as mud or sand, and obviously a lot of time and effort to build these massive castles. There are chambers within these termite mounds, so they're not hollow. I mean, it's more solid than hollow, but there are tunnels and small openings where they'll farm their fungus and obviously be able to kind of highways that allows them from move to move from A to B. This is so cool seeing them ferret around with very little concern for our presence. Hello to Catherine. You would like to know if these animals are omnivores. Yes, I think they will occasionally feed on vegetable matter, but it's mainly a carnivorous diet that they feed on. Just going to have a quick look at my book to see what else they say regarding food. Insects, other invertebrates, to a lesser extent, small reptiles, birds and their eggs. Fruit has also been recorded. So yes, they are omnivorous, but mainly carnivorous, and they are, interestingly, the smallest carnivores we get out here in Africa. James Richards, well, you've been thinking of some names for the possibility that we may try and closely follow these animals and habituate a specific troop. There was a similar documentary or show done called Meerkat Manor. And you are thinking of a few names. 
Mongoose Madness, Dwarf, Dwarf Domain, and Diminutive Dominion. Wow. Um, difficult for Brian to know where to film and for, for me where to watch. The action is unfolding. These two appear to be having a bit of a wrestling match, establishing who's who and who's more dominant. This is awesome. I think all of the names you've suggested, James Richards, are very good. So I like your extra efforts as to what you think is going to be the name of. And then it'll be interesting to see if, in fact, a, a troop of mongooses is managed to be habituated or does manage to be habituated. I think it's something of an exciting prospect. Oh, this one is definitely king of the castle now. This is one of the best sightings I've had of these creatures in all my time. They are so at ease with us playing about here. And we've got some really good views of them out in the open. So I hope you're all enjoying this. This isn't a regular sighting, one could say. It'd be wonderful to actually get to understand these animals better with a lot of the characters out here, I mean, you can read in the textbooks and they can tell you, you know, there's an alpha male and a female within this troop, a beta female, or even third in charge may also mates. But to understand the complexities of any individual family will be different. It's no different to looking at human families. There will always be different characters, different dynamics between individuals within a troop or family of any given species. There's an imposter. You don't belong here, little squirrel. But cashing in on the safety and numbers. Now, you guys were just chatting yesterday, we all were chatting yesterday about the size differences between squirrels and mongooses. So I'm hoping we're gonna get a two shot. It's just to the right there, Brian, next to the log. Yeah, there it goes. Maybe, just maybe we're gonna be able to see a mongoose and a squirrel in the same shot. That way you'll get to see that they are just about the same size. Brian's zooming out, hoping that there's gonna be another mongoose nearby, which there is. Oh, and some right behind it. Perfect. Well, isn't this a bonus? Let's see if they don't jump on the squirrel's back and give it a hard time thinking about it. Oh. <laughs> that would have been so cool. But it's still good to see that those two are having a rough and tumble. I've got a feeling they're going to come tumbling down what is a very oh, steep bank. Yep, there they go. <laughs> Look at this. They are frighteningly quick. I don't know how Brian's managing to keep on them as he is. They are like little rockets. Oh, they're getting seriously involved with one another's wrestling match. Now, one just went flying down to the base of the mound. The other one looks like it's catching up to it now. Don't get confused. That's a different one. That's not the one you're wrestling with. Yes, that's your wrestling partner there. Who knows whether this is brother or sister or cousins or brother and brother. Anyway, it's great to see them having so much fun with one another. They are definitely two youngsters. And this cool weather is making for perfect play conditions. Hello to Minute Migs, and you are a new viewer, and you've come and joined us at a right time. This is a fascinating sighting of these little critters. You've mentioned, are we studying the animals from the Lion King? Yes, I guess we are, but I don't think there were mongooses in the Lion King. It was a cousin of theirs, the meerkat. That was Timon. Pumbaa's friend. Sadly, we don't get Timon's here. 
But we do get these guys, which are fairly similar. Considerably smaller, though. But on a morning like this, we are getting absolutely spoiled with their playtime that we're getting allowed to be involved in, or at least be a part of by viewing. You'd like to know what would happen if a squirrel and a mongoose ever got into an altercation. It's unlikely that they would. They, uh, there's no competition between the two. One uh, species, the mongooses, are the carnivores, and the tree squirrels are the herbivores. So because there's very little competition between the two, you'll find that they don't mind one another's presence at all. And I've never seen an altercation. I mean, the closest I've actually ever seen those two species together was just a few moments ago that you got to see when those young mongooses inquisitively came up to the tail of the squirrel. But the squirrel thought, let me get out of here. I don't want to get stuck in this childish play. This one's got back into the sentry point. Scanning the perimeter. It looks like the rest of the troop have moved further off behind this termite mound. So there's not nearly as many members moving around as possible. And I'm guessing the sentry may well move along and follow the rest of the troop, maybe just bringing up all the members that are lagging at the back. Wonderful. Well, I think we can continue now, now that things have calmed down to panic here. What a great sighting. <clears throat> Hello to Sand Blaster. You would like to know if ferrets are related to mongooses? I don't have a clue. Not too sure what family ferrets are in. Um, so I can't help you there. Apologies for that. They could be. I mean, quite a similar creature, at least in terms of appearance. Sunisa, in India, you'd like to know how do we spot such tiny little critters so easily? Well, uh, I guess this is what we do day in and day out. Uh, if we don't keep our eyes peeled and honed looking for things to show you, um, we wouldn't uh, be able to do a very good job. So I guess just like anything, because we are here, day in and day out and have been at least for me many years doing this looking for animals you become used to what to look out for i guess just like any job you learn the, the, the secrets of any trade the tricks that i could pass on to you uh, when out on safari or wherever you may be looking for animals is try and look for obscurities more so than the actual animal and what i mean by that is you're looking for something that's out of place, um, you know, like a head on top of a termite bound, and ears, so a shape more than an animal. Um, little bits of movement, a flick of an ear, a flash of movements. Um, I don't know if that's helping much, but yeah, you, you'd be wrong to try and be like, I'm looking for a leopard because leopards are so well camouflaged, so rather look for the flick of a tail, a portion of a leopard, or something that just doesn't fit in with the surroundings. At night, when we're driving around with the spotlights, when we spot the chameleons, we're not looking for a chameleon, and all we, 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 we're focusing in on or honing in on is something different. The whole bush is a green color, 
for the you know the uniform leaf coloration and the chameleon will be a slightly different shade within that bush that is mainly one green color and that little obscurity once you investigate further will lead you to a chameleon or something else of interest maybe a bird Great. Well, we're going to continue scanning and searching for these obscurities, and while we do that, we're going to send you across to James, who's found a bird. <laughs> um, we, just, we, uh, we have the most wonderful shot of a basilea, and it's now basically trying, no, it knows how far up we can turn the camera, and it will not get within frame. There we go, a male bird, a male battalier on the hunt for something to eat. He was also much lower down and he's obviously found himself a thermal. And he will be able to find a thermal that is much less sort of um, obvious and much less strong than needed to lift the vultures because he has much less drag when he flies because of that very short tail. Well done, David. That was not easy for you. Uh, Rusty, of course, was reversing at about 60 miles an hour, which, uh, well done, Rusty. He doesn't like to be treated with great um, vigor. Okay. We've done yet another loop around the same area where we had those alarm-calling monkeys. I've come up with no tracks at all, so I don't know what they were going on about. Perhaps a python. Anyway, we had a good time with the hyena den. And that's, what's interesting, of course, is that they did eat something last night. Now, I wonder maybe if there isn't a leopard around that was that killed last night, maybe something large like a nyala or a kudu, and those hyenas then pilfered that. And that's what's going on around there. That's quite possible. Because those hyenas have definitely eaten. And the fact that there's no meat at the den and the fact that the matriarch has eaten, and she's a dominant female, so she would bring meat back if she wanted to. It's quite possible that they ate quite close by and then went back to the den. So, I don't know that we'll ever know the answer to that. interesting question here, and it is, a, I mean, it's a, I haven't thought of it like this, but it is interesting. Mohammed, we were watching the hyenas, and you're obviously under the impression that hyenas eat animals while they're still alive, which is not really the case. But it does bring up an interesting discussion. You say, why not if a, you know that we don't interfere in nature, but why not if a hyena is uh, killing a buffalo, why wouldn't we just shoot the buffalo and put it out of its misery so that the hyena can then eat it? Um, Mohammed, the reason is because we don't want to have an effect on the bush here. So the other day we had an incident where a pride of lions, the Nkufuma pride, caught a young zebra and they started to eat it before it was dead and it actually took a long time, well, it felt like a long time, probably about three or four minutes for the zebra to die. And this was very difficult for us to watch. It wasn't pleasant at all, and it was quite traumatic, and no doubt not particularly pleasant for the zebra. But I don't think the zebra actually felt a huge amount. I think you go, they go into shock, and then eventually they don't feel pain anymore. And, you know, although the noise is not very pleasant, they don't feel too much pain. But secondly, Mohammed, we don't know what's going to happen. Remember, the distress calls of a buffalo, for example, will bring, let's say some lions are killing a buffalo, its distress calls will bring in other predators. They will bring in the hyenas. It will bring in the rest of the herd to try and rescue it. As soon as we start interfering, a whole lot of unintended consequences happen. So, for example, if we were to find a buffalo being killed by lions and it was making a tremendous noise and we shot it and put it out of its misery so that the lions could eat it, can you imagine then what would happen as a kind of... Um, a widening of unintended consequence. If it didn't make a noise and the hyenas didn't come in, well, then the hyenas wouldn't find nearly as much to eat. Uh, maybe the male lions of the area, who would also be attracted by the distress calls, wouldn't find enough to eat. And so you have all these unintended consequences. And so that's why, Mohammed, as far as possible, we have a hands-off approach. Obviously.
obviously we do interfere. We're in a vehicle that makes a big noise driving around on roads that cut through the bush. So there's no question that we do have an effect. I mean, we're driving through quarantine clearings there, which is a mechanically cleared area. So we do have an effect, but we try as far as possible not to have an effect on the animals. So I hope that answers your question. Let's go and have a look at Treehouse Dam where Ribbon and I think, who was the other one? Mpombo, I think, was the other male hyena who were playing there. I cannot identify these hyenas. It is the expert hyena identifiers on the internet that were able to identify all these different hyenas. Sorry, let me just go again. Kirsten, can you go again with that? Scott is at Treehouse Dam, so we won't go to Treehouse Dam. Let's reverse. Scott has taken my plan. All right, let's go across to Scott. He's got Treehouse Dam, he's got an impala there, and I'll catch up with you perhaps on this road. Well, it looks like some impala are coming to make the most of the newly filled up Treehouse water hole. Apologies, I was playing with my phone there and that was an unexpected surprise. Doo -dee -doo. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, we're just basically trying to play some soothing melodies to these impalas to help them relax as they try and find a spot to drink. I don't know why they're choosing this portion of the water hole because closer towards us, there is a perfect spot to come and drink. But maybe they're not planning on drinking, but merely passing by, and we just assumed that they were coming here for drink. There is a lot of water around at the moment, and that means water sources like this will not necessarily be as active as one would expect, because the animals can quench their thirst at all manner of little puddles and ponds elsewhere. Good, a little bachelor herd of impala here at the treehouse waterhole. There's no treehouse to see here, just to let everyone know, especially the newer viewers. Tony, you would like to see a marula tree, and they are all over the low felt in this area of it. Here's one right here. They've got mottled bark. They're quite leafy at this stage of the year. Well, here we go. Let's start with the bark. So mottled bark, lots of different colours along it. So that's one distinguishing feature. And as Brian zooms up the tree, they will often also be quite thick horizontal branches here is one so that's a tree that leopards like to sleep in for this very reason another distinguishing characteristic of them is that they've got very thick terminal branches it's going to be difficult to see at this time of the year because the the trees are so leafy but basically the the terminal ends of a lot of the branches are as thick as your fingers they don't end in very thin twigs like most trees do so that's another characteristic of them They've just finished fruiting, Tony, so sadly there's no more fruits to see. But only the female trees will bear the fruits, not both tree or male and female tree will bear fruits. And that's something I thought was quite interesting. I thought all trees had fruits, but they don't. You get males and females. So that is the mighty Maruda tree. You say you make soap out of the oils from them, I wonder where exactly the oils are coming from, whether it's from the rich oily seed or nut that grows within the fruit or that is found within the fruit rather, or if it's from another part of the tree. I'm also wondering, Tony, how you acquire these marula oils. So tell us a little bit more about your soap. I know that uh, fruit is very, very high in vitamin C and 
think there are various companies or new companies that are making products like creams and soaps out of them. Clancy in Ohio. Let's see if we can show this little steer and bucket's default move. Have you got it there, Brian? It's about yeah. 10. Ah, oh, there it goes. No worries. It darted off into the unknown, as they often do. It's actual, it's default move. It actually lay down to try and hide from us. And then when it realized that wasn't working, when we locked eye contact with it, it thought, let's rather get out of here. Clancy, you would like to know if there are any bloodwood trees here. I'm not exactly sure what a bloodwood tree means, but I'm guessing a tree that's got a very red tannins, uh, which if you were to chop it open would look something like blood. And yes, the marula tree is one of those. You can boil the bark of marula tree, uh, and poachers often will do this, and it creates a very red tannin, and you can put your clothes in there, to stain them a natural color that helps you blend into the bush. I've done that before. I did a marula tie-dye of a vest. I don't know where that ended up, but it does stain a very red color. And there are quite a number of trees here with red pigments or red tannins. A lot of the bush willows, the marulas, are some that I can think of. But like I said, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you are wanting to work out. I'm not sure what a bloodwood is exactly. Oh, well, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. It looks like the clouds may possibly burn off. There's a little bit of sun coming through. We may have a sunny afternoon, but only time will tell. James Richards, you have mentioned that we've seen a honey badger, two secretary birds, I forget the other rare critter, but that, oh, the cheetah, basically it's been a good year regarding the more rare characters of Juma and Arethusa, and you are suggesting that the next one we could hopefully tick off the list will be an aardvark. That would be great. But uh, tricky. If you do see one, it's going to be a miracle, basically, because we don't spend long hours after dark. First problem. The second problem is they are very, very nervous of vehicles. So it would be far easier for uh, us to show six guests an aardvark in the distance barreling off through the bush. But after dark, with the spotlight, getting the camera zoomed in on it as it runs off through the bushes, I fear will be near impossible. A pangolin, though, is a, is a, better, a better prospect because they're not fast moving. Also equally rare, we've never showed you one. Um, that will be a better, more realistic target to aim for. But yes, I mean, anything's possible. As we all know, you could get lucky and see a, a good sighting of an aardvark, but I just feel like with the way things are currently done, it's going to be... Maybe the, maybe, maybe the pangolin is a better option to hope for. Sorry about that signal break up there, everyone. Fascinating news that Tony, you seem to be a marula soap maker, which I think is a particularly impressive thing. Uh, where on earth do you get your marula from? 
We have a Tony in Holland and a Tony in England, and I don't know of a Tony in South Africa. Oh. You know what? If I had some kind of a pro projectile throwing thing, that Drongo would be in trouble. It sat so beautifully until the second we tried to turn the camera onto it. And then it flew off and nearly made me say a very bad word. Anyway, Tony, I would like to use your marula soap. If you could send some through, that would be great. It's probably worth more than gold, however, because to extract marula oil is not an easy thing. My plan for the rest of the drive is to drive down towards Impala Plains, which is a clearing over here, and then we'll head up towards the north and see if maybe there aren't some track, tracks of shadow. Sorry, Jennifer in San Francisco. I just missed, you want to know about a particular tree? to know what the name of the tree is that has the sap that critters eat. Um, Jennifer, you'll find that the sap of just about all the trees here will be edible to most of the animals, but the one I think you may be talking about is the sap of acacia trees. Now, there are many different kinds of acacia trees that we get here. We find red thorns, we find knob thorns, we find sweet thorns, we find all sorts of different acacias. And the most sweet one seems to be that of the red thorn, Acacia gerardii. And it's a fair, ooh, look at that. I think these are possibly the same giraffe you saw this morning, but a whole group of them. By far the largest group I've seen for a long time. So I think you also saw them yesterday afternoon. So giraffe will come into an area for a while, they spend a couple of weeks, and then they disappear again, and for weeks we don't see giraffe. This is fantastic. Anyway, Jennifer, so it's largely the acacia trees, as I say, and the bush babies especially are particularly fond of acacia gum when there are no insects to eat. So peaceful, just as the sun comes out, one of them's just laying down. Let's just sneak slowly forward. I'm just gonna roll forward so we can get a picture of all of them here in the clearing without this large leadwood tree in the way. Natasha, you're in Ontario, and you want to know why it is that animals like giraffe regurgitate their food and re-chew it. Natasha, they are part of a very large order of herbivores called the ruminatia, and that means that they are all ruminants, exactly like a domestic cow. Now, what that means is that their stomach is designed with four chambers. And in very basic terms, the animal eats the leaves, has a very sort of e subtle chew on it, and then swallows the food almost whole. And then it sits in the first chamber of the stomach called the rumen. And that's almost like a storage vat. And then after a while, you can see the little one lying down now. After a while, when that storage vat is full, they must stop eating regurgitate the food up into the mouth again, rechew it and swallow it into the second stomach. And although that sounds like it must be quite inefficient, it isn't. It's a very effective way of getting the nutrients that you need out of vegetation. So the rechewing process is very important. They chew and chew and chew and break down all the cellulose and lignin, which is the structural material of plants, which you have to break down if you want to try and get nutrition out of plants. And then the other thing that it does is that initial session in that sort of vat or storage vat just allows the beginnings of fermentation to take place so it softens up the food before it's rechewed again. And then it goes through the other chambers of the stomach and comes out normally extremely fine and devoid of nutrients at the other end. And so it's a really efficient way of getting nutrition. And the reason 
I mean that so many animals, from deer to giraffe to all of the buffalo that we have here, all of the antelope, they're all ruminants, and it's just a very effective way of getting diet or nutrition out of a purely vegetarian diet with no fruit in it either. Now, Lisa, you're a new viewer on YouTube, and you're obviously quite astute because you're saying, what, are the, what is the tree that they're eating there? They're eating a tree at the moment, that one particularly, is called Zizifus mucronata, or the buffalo thorn. It's a great favorite with many animals out here. It tastes much like spinach, actually. You can eat it as a human being. And they think they like it because it's got so little or much less of that structural material that I was talking about, also much less in the way of chemical compounds that try and protect it. So no kind of tannins and nasty aromatic oils that make it smell bad or taste bad. It tastes very good and fairly bland, really. But it, what it does have is some very aggressive thorns, which don't seem to affect the giraffe one jot. And the other two, um, if I can ask you to pan off to the side there, to the left there, David, there are two more obviously eating, one lying down there and one to the left of that, and they seem to be eating knobthorn trees. Those are acacia trees, very high in protein, I think, but also they will produce tannins, which means that they can't be eaten all the time. The tannins are not particularly good for the stomach unless you have an upset stomach. And that is why, everybody, when you have an upset stomach, you drink black tea because it is full of tannin. Yeah. She's actually eating a black monk. That's a black monkey thorn. Same thing, though, as the knob thorn. Uh, now, Sandblaster, you ask a very astute question, of course. Lots of different giraffe here, all of them different colors, and you want to know why the different colors. Do they get o darker as they get older? Um, the males tend to get darker as they get older, Sandblaster, like that chap there. Um, I don't think he's a particularly old bull. I think he's in the flush of his, um, his adulthood. I think he's a very good-looking fellow. But Sandblaster, they start off at different colors which means that they're never going to be a uniform color, and it's just simply the same as human beings have different hair colors. There's no real difference. It's not a different race of giraffe. It's not a different kind of um, uh, subspecies of giraffe. They've all just got different colors because they, much like us, have different color hair. Same as with a lot of lion, you know, a lot of lion's manes, or the, you know, they vary from black to fairly pale blonde. That said, the males do get darker as they get older. The females tend not to have that issue, or that characteristic. And the females are quite sort of, the one on the left there, you can see who he's eyeing, is a, a redhead, basically. You can see she's got really chestnut-colored markings. And that's quite unusual, or well, it's distinctive, certainly. So that is the giraffe, and there is a young giraffe here, of course, lying down in the clearings. And from the young giraffe lying down in the clearings, let us head across to what can look like a donkey. This is a tiny little baby waterbuck that is still relying on its mother to lick its bottom in order to induce it to defecate. So that's an interesting thing. Oh, cute. That's an interesting thing regarding a lot of animals is that if you do ever have an orphaned one, you will have to simulate this licking of the backside motion with wet fingers is often what is suggested in order to induce a little poop. And we just saw that happening just before you joined us. Didn't see the results thereof, but wonderful to see a mother tending to her tiny little calf. You can possibly hear a woodpecker drumming nearby. 
That'll be a bearded woodpecker. Look at that tiny little ring on the calf's bottom. <laughs> it is minute. I'm not sure how old exactly, but it has been born very recently. You can even see it's still a little bit shaky on its feet, so I'd put it at least no longer than a week on the planet would be my guess. Wunderbar. Oh, the zebra just, zebra's just popped onto the scene. Let's get you a glimpse of that quickly. There we go. It looks like a stallion to me. I'm not sure where the rest of his harem are, or maybe he's just a member of a bachelor herd who's yet to secure some ladies in his life. Looking nice and clean after the rain we've had, though. Pick one part of its body. I like to start on their nose and then kind of just follow the flow of stripes. It's quite fun working out where you end up and just getting lost in that hypnotic pattern. You can also start on a hoof maybe and just follow your way up that way, but I find them incredibly interesting animals to get lost in whilst watching. The Grevy's zebra, the zebra you get up in East Africa is probably the most hypnotizing of them all. They've got many, many stripes, very thin black and white stripes, not nearly as thick as the plain zebra we've just seen here. They've also got ginormous ears, uh, probably the most hypnotizing of all the zebra species in my books. I've taken off my jacket, just the tiny bit of sun that was making it th way through the clouds has really uh, caused us to heat up. Hello, Sparkles Canyon Otter. What a fine name you have. You would like to know if the Inkahuma Pride have had a meal since the zebra fall that they snacked on, and yes, they certainly have. They have fed on... Check my earpiece, is still working. Yes, um, they fed on an adult female buffalo that they killed with the Birmingham males, at least a few members of the Birmingham Coalition, across on Torchwood. She was an adult female buffalo that was heavily pregnant. They pulled out the fetus. Uh, that she was about to give birth to. And they finished that, well, they abandoned that carcass the day before yesterday. So not last night, the night before they left that kill, it was finished. Um, and I'm not sure if they've fed on anything since then. It's only been 36 hours and they would have been full of buffalo, so they wouldn't have been hugely pressured to feed. And as far as our update went this morning from the guys across at Sibambili who found those five ladies, they didn't have any food with them. So, not too sure, nothing confirmed since the buffalo. But like I said, they'll have more than enough food in their belly to last them at least another three, four days. A new viewer watching on YouTube, you would like to know how the dazzling stripes of a zebra impact the predator's view of them. Well, it is a disruptive form of camouflage, so predators basically see in, in shades of black and white. They don't have good color vision. Um, so if a whole herd of zebras standing together, they all kind of blend in, making it difficult for the predator to, to distinguish young from old, big from weak, one from another. Um, so it will have a disruptive effect on them. 
Um, but to be honest, there's still m many varied suggestions and theories as to why they have these stripes, but none of which have made perfect sense. So the way that they've evolved into this very unique coloration compared to that of other animals leads most people to not be certain as to why exactly that is the case. But there is a strong argument that it will, in certain scenarios, uh, disrupt the predator's ability to analyze exactly what they're looking at. Scott and Della, who are watching in Ohio, they love the honey badger sighting, the brief glimpse we have had of one this morning, and are wondering if we were to spend more time out after dark, would we have uh, more sightings of them and possibly better sightings of them? Uh, yes, I do think we would. A lot of the animals uh, that are nervous during the day can be more relaxed at night time as a general rule and I guess if you just spend more and more time out tonight there's a chance you will habituate them very slowly. So yes I think that would be the case. Again it depends if you are what equipment you're using. If you're using infrared equipment that would be a jackpot because as soon as you shine a spotlight on an animal it knows that it's under the spotlight as would you know if you're walking around in the dark and then all of a sudden there was a beaming light on you you would react to that. Um, whereas infrared, they will not realize that they are being watched and that way we would be able to watch them, I think, having very little impact on their behavior. So good prospects, I guess, for the future of night drives, but for now, um, it's still a bit of a way off before we get there. Judy H, uh, you remember that I took a little marula sapling that was growing in the middle of the road and was therefore doomed, it was never going to make it. Uh, and you're wondering if it's grown. I can't remember what I did with that specific one. I know I did give one to VM and that's still growing, it's still surviving in the Cape, which is very different in the climate, in the climate here, so happy that that one is still surviving. Um, another one that I think I did take care of didn't make it. Um, I was trying to bonsai it, also in Cape Town, and that one passed away, sadly. But I've got another one that's doing really well that I found this year, growing in one of these sandy riverbeds. Again, it was never going to make it, and then the next rains that come through would just wash it away. Uh, and that one's growing well. That one's doing in my shower. It's that time of the morning again. Time to say thank you and goodbye. So, thank you and goodbye. It's been great fun. Well done to Kirsty who was directing the show. Nikki who was lending a hand there. And Brian and his thumb. Thank you for filming. And of course to you guys. Thank you for joining in. Also a big thanks to Brian for spotting that honey badger. How could I have forgotten to thank him for that? And we are going to send you across to James now so he can say his goodbyes. We will see you all on the Sunset Safari. Right, everyone, there. Oh, that's a, what a lovely time for you to come across to us, just as the crested barbet, beautiful bird, had his morning constitutional in front of you. Anyway, beautiful bird, as I say, red and orange and yellow and black and white and very scruffy, unusually for a bird. They always look a little bit like they've run through a hedge. Oh, there's another one there. I wonder if they don't have a nest here. There's a dead tree, exactly the kind of tree that a barbet would like to live in. 
hop, hop, hopping about. Let me just sneak slowly forward. We also found a black fly catcher here, which unfortunately took fright and flew off. Very unkind of him. Isn't that beautiful? Madison, you say this guy has the best job ever, super jelly. Um, I'm assuming you mean me and not the, uh, not, not the, uh, not the crested barbet. I think I have an easier job than the crested barbet. Right, Madison and all the rest of you wonderful viewers out there, thank you for your questions and comments throughout the course of this morning. It was really wonderful. And again, my luck, not fantastic, David. We have to improve our... I think we have to improve, basically. We'll get there. Thank you very much for your efforts, David. Big thanks to Scott, of course, on the other vehicle with Brian and to Kirsty and Nikki in the final control. We'll see you later at 4 o'clock. Bye-bye.